Chapter 41. In the thick of it, too gobsmacked, I watched on as the Jedi known as Anakin Skywaker proceeded to fuck himself out of the gunship door and latch on to one of the B-2s. All of this being done while both parties were attacking each other. Lycan, come on, we need to go! Ayla shouted, snapping me out of my stupor. Pointing at the raving mad Jedi, I tell her, Take a look at this dafty, what's he even planning on doing? Squinting her eyes, Isla eventually notices the Jedi Knight desperately holding on to the Separatist droid. Skywalker? She mumbled in a confused tone. No wonder she's confused. It's not every day you get to witness such a strange situation. Casually ignoring the blaring warning sirens, we both watch on in silence. Subsequently, seeing Anakin and the droid plunge through one of the holes in the ship's hull in a crash landing. That worked out well for him, eh? Grabbing my arm and placing it over her shoulder, Ayla says, Let's get moving. We'll meet up with General Skywalker and his Padawan. At least we will, if he's still in one piece. With that, I started my aided speed limp towards the escape pods, while Ayla tried to get in contact with Anakin through her transceiver, mumbling a curse or two as it failed to work. What can I say? With enough persistence and drive you can ever get training Jedi to embrace the true tongue of the Scots. In other words, a fuckload of swearing. Although we moved relatively quickly, Isla's attempt at stabilizing me wasn't working in its intended manner. With her clocking in at just under 5'7", and me recently reaching 6'7", the arm over the shoulder wasn't doing much, and I ended up using her as more of a walking stick while she wrapped an arm around my waist for support. As we made our way through the halls, massive impacts were rumbling through the ship's hull, possibly the seps sending additional forces through those drill, like one used ships that were chalked full of battle droids. Not far away from our current position were Bly, Lucky, Cameron and Flash pressed against the passage wall to avoid enemy fire. Every so often, they'd pop out and let loose a few shots in retaliation, taking a few B2s down before getting behind cover once again, but it wasn't enough to stop the relentless push of the droids. Even as we made our way over, more and more activated and joined the line. Luckily, now we were here. There was a simple solution. Just behind their positions was a blast door, inactive, along with much of the rest of the ship's electricals. It was impossible for them to bring it down, but easy enough for one of us. As we reached the corner, Isla said, I'll block while you bring the blast door down. It should be enough to hold them back for now. All too happy to go along with her plan, I called out to the soldiers. Troopers, fall back to my position. Easily hearing my strong voice, the four clones used the standard tactic for retreating and swiftly slipped, being me and their general. As Isla was blocking shots aimed to kill, I ripped the door from its stationary position, bringing it crashing to the floor and successfully cutting off the droid's path. Let's move. The comms are jammed and I can't get through to General Skywalker, but the pilots under his command managed to get a message through. There's a ship waiting for us. We'll head to the bay. Howitz, if we're lucky, we'll meet them on our way. Isla stated to the clones as he fixed her hold on me. With better options available, I chose to cause less hassle for my master. Lucky, sorry to bother you again, but I'll need your help. Understanding what I was trying to convey, he took me off Isla's and fitted me with a more comfortable carry. With a much quicker pace, primarily thanks to me being dragged along, we rushed to the hangar bay. Once we were close to our objective, we found out that our path was blocked. A section of the ship filled with crossroads which used to be empty was now crawling with enemy droids, B-1s, B-2s, those rockety cunts you name it. They were all here. With no choice left but to fight or way through, we engaged the enemy. Isla taking point, with me in the center surrounded by clones, while I couldn't show off my lightsaber moves, I could still use ranged techniques, and that's exactly what I did. Raising an arm, bright yellow bolts of lightning flew from my fingertips. The stream was much refined compared to how it was before the war kicked off. With that refinement, brought control and power, highlighted as the electricity curved round my allies and wrecked its way through droid after droid. As soon as the force judgment started going out of range, the remaining charges of electricity met up once again and latched onto an unlucky droid. Using whatever power it had left, 
the charge overheated the droid's main processor to the point of explosion before any of its compatriots could react. The droid blew, taking with the its entire group. Using the lighting to cause explosions was my best idea in a while. Tried it on other things as well, less mechanical, more biological, and it's messy. Doesn't do it enough justice. With our small group working like a well-oiled battle machine, we tore our way through scores of droids and pushed towards the ship, waiting to whisk us away. When suddenly coming from another corridor, a B-2 was sent crashing through a bunch of B-1s, following shortly behind it was the man of the hour, the youngling slayer himself, Anakin Skywalker, and Ahsoka and Captain Rex. There were no words spoken just yet, as we made our final push to the ship, although Ahsoka did give me a nod of recognition, plus a wince at my injuries. Festering skin and scars must not be in fashion nowadays. With the reinforcements here, we made quick work of the remaining hostels and made a break for the ship. Halfway down the final hallway, a resounding boom echoed through the entire ship, and with sensitive ears, I picked up the roar of a blaze heading straight for us. We were almost in, but the fire was too quick. As it peeked around the corner, Anakin spoke for the first time since his arrival. We're not gonna make it, as pushed everyone one forwards into the ship, and at the same time started to close the blast door to protect us. Master, no! Ahsoka cried out. At that moment the world seemed to slow down to a crawl. Everything moved at a slug's pace, all except for the colossal fireball heading for Anakin. Fuck, I'm going to regret this. Channeling the force through my body, I speed up to an insane degree, squeezing through the closing blast doors. I grabbed Anakin's stationary body by the neck and pulled him back into the safe zone. To everyone else it must have looked like teleportation. Sadly, if it was, I wouldn't be collapsing to my knees in agony. The strain of using both force speed and force valor at the same time was too much for my already injured body. Muscles tore, skin was ripped back open, and a killer headache ensued. Lycan? I barely heard Isla shout as she instantaneously appeared next to me. My vision was fuzzy and hearing numbed as I was pulled onto a stretcher on the skip. I could feel my consciousness beginning to fade as I used the last of my vestige to close up some wounds. Ah, shite, here we go again. Chapter 42, In the Thick of It 3 Being on solid ground after that whole fiasco was a godsend. Lying next to me was Isla, currently looking over all my wound dressing, most of which were slathered in dried blood and smelled like rusting iron, though they were for the best part healed, it still never stopped Ayla from worrying. Luckily, after getting hooked up to the Bacta tank on board the ship, I was able to stay conscious and get to work on healing my injuries. Though, to be honest, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. I think I've been scarred for life with this mission. Too much shite happened in one day. There's an entire list on the amount of times I nearly died today. First, it was being shot by a fucking missiles. Then it was narrowly escaping a spontaneously combusting starship. If that's not good enough, after escaping the pilots taking us away were killed, sending us onto an uncalculated hyperspace jump that had us a midge's ball hair off smacking into a star, a fucking star. Then to top it off, the icing on the cake was crash landing onto a random moon orbiting said star. What a fucking day. With that thought at the forefront of my mind, I pulled out my fag packet and got to chiefin. Being that skilled at sneakily smoking, Ayla never even noticed till was a quarter of the way through it. It was quite cute the way her nose started twitching as she caught a whiff of the smell. What wasn't cute was the wraithful expression that coated her face the second she realized what was going on. Really, Lycan? Smoking already? You've already injured your lungs twice today, and you think it's a good idea to be smoking? She angrily said, looking me dead in the eye. To be honest, I don't think it's a good idea. Inhale, I just think I deserve one after that shiter of a day. Ending my string of words with a wheezing cough didn't do much to help my case. It only ended up pissing Ayla off even more. Visibly shaking in fury, Ayla demanded, Give me the damn cigarette. I just looked the other way and kept on puffing. Big mistake. While I was looking at the clones who were dragged along on this shitty adventure with us, I noticed none of them were catching my eye. Strange, most of the clones love me, 
They treat me like one of the boys, and we get a good laugh when not dismantling battle droids. In my confusion, I nearly never noticed the blue Twi'lek snaking herself around me, edging towards the source of her frustrations. Before she managed to steal my comfort smoke, I took notice of her and tried to roll out the way, which never worked as Isla latched onto me like a leech to skin. It devolved into a mixer gender wrestling match, and not the good kind. Normally I could just throw her over my shoulder and be done with it, but having my body ripped apart and healed twice in one day meant I was sore all over. My body being in agony meant that her taps against my skin felt like blaster bolts burning away at the affected area. My whole body feeling like it was in a blast furnace didn't make it easy to move, never mind use any strength. So the scales were tipped in Isla's favor. Not caring about playing fair, I called for reinforcements. Lucky, Flash, Cameron, help me out here. Not wanting to back me up, the clones ignored my pleas, though even if they were thinking about it, having Bly watching them like a hawk helped with their decision. One of the clones that I don't get along with is Bly. I don't hate him or anything, and we work together fine. But out of battle, he's the most boring cunt on the planet. He's a complete by the book kind of guy, and doesn't approve of me or the others messing around and drinking ourselves unconscious. Says we should prepare for the next mission and shit like that, a proper damper to the mood. With the wet blanket keeping them in line, I was left on my lonesome against a frisky toilet. Changing my tactics, I shouted as loud as possible, Help! Please! This is sexual assault! Stop looking the other way! With the saddest look my face could pull off, I say, and you, call yourselves soldiers of the Republic. At the first part, I could feel Ayla's body temperature rise a few levels. Sadly, I wasn't able to see her blushing. The clones still ignored me, fucking bastards. I'll remember this. All out of options, I was left on the floor, feeling violated, defeated, and down. Half a smoke. After Ayla grabbed it, she made sure to stamp it out before taking the entire packet and sticking them in her belt pouch. Still, she forgot I always bring extra with me. Reaching into my hidden pocket, I pull out... Nothing. Damn, she knew about that as well. She's getting good. With the bout finished, Isla got back to wrapping me in new bandages. I just gave up trying to do anything else and took in the view. The twin peaks dangling in front of my face were a picturesque sight worth beholding. Soon after the whole fiasco came Anakin, Ahsoka and Rex, who were checking through the rubble to see if there was anything salvageable. Gripping the lightsaber on his belt, Anakin said, Are you all right? We heard pained shouts coming from your direction. I just started laughing as Ayla's skin darkened and she averted her eyes. Saving Ayla from a possibly embarrassing situation was Bly. The general and the commander were just speaking about our next steps. They just got a bit loud while doing it. Is that so? Anakin said, relaxing his grip on his weapon. What did you come up with? There's nothing worth collecting in the wreckage so we can leave here whenever. Recovering from her sudden embarrassment, Ala replies, There's a path going through the tall grass there. If we follow it, it could take us to a settlement. Happy with the straightforward plan, Anakin falls in agreement. Let's get moving then, shall we? Calling out to Flash, Ala ordered, Flash, carry Lycan, he's still injured. Yes, ma'am, the trooper replied, swiftly coming to my side and wrapping my arm around his shoulder. As that happened, I made sure to put as much weight as possible on the fucker, who never backed me up. Being six plus seven and built with pure muscle makes me quite the heavy Zabrak, and Flash here's going to be carrying that weight as punishment for not helping a brother out. Thanks for the help, Flash, I said with an evil smile. Chapter 43 In the Thick of It 4 the group of us trudged our way down the natural dirt pathway through the obnoxiously tall grass that surrounded us. As in me standing on the tips of my toes, still couldn't see over the grass kind of tall. The only other plant we could see was the colossal green and brown trees that towered over everything else in the grasslands. They've got to be a good hundred meters high at the minimum. Looking closely, I could make out small oval-shaped bulges that mixed themselves in with the tree's foliage. While small from a distance, those oval-looking objects probably held quite the mass. Our stay on this planet, Meridune, or some shite, wasn't looking out to be very comfy. We had no clue where to go, 
bare minimum rations, and to top it off, we've got no way of contacting the Republic for a pickup. The only silver lining is that we managed to rummage a survival kit from the wreckage that was filled with tents and pots and shit. Honestly, I've no clue what's inside it. Dozed off while Bly rhymed off a list of our supplies. It's been a fucking while since I last had a non-drug-induced sleep, which might I add, doesn't actually register as sleep. Add on all of the physical strain I put myself through, and the tiredness really adds up. So currently I was fucking shattered. Once the adrenaline wears off, your body just wants to slip into sleep mode. Especially if it's been pieced together multiple times in 24 hours. The further we walked, the more groggy my movements were getting. It felt horrible. You've seen better days, Ahsoka said as she walked next to me. Lazily turning my head to look at her, I managed to reply. Really? I always thought I was quite handsome. Top 0.1% in the galaxy at least. Though I uttered that, I had the feeling that I just might terrify the locals if they saw me right now. Tattooed all over, and eyes redder than a shock tease fanny, these miniature monkeys are in for the fright of their life. You know what I'm talking about, Ahsoka said, letting a hint of displeasure slip into her tone. With a conflicted look, her eyes glided over the multiple discolored scars that coated my arms, pausing for a moment longer at the fresh ones I recently patched up. Force healing, man. Best idea I've ever had. 100% I'd be dead if I hadn't learned it, or at the very least I'd have a few mechanical organs churning away inside me. Blows my mind why more of them don't learn it. Fair dues if you don't have a knack for it, but there's no excuse if you're able to do it and still choose to not. Fucking Jedi man. Abstinent bastards. Mulling on that thought, my eyes were drawn to Anakin, someone who should get on the force healing wave. Thinking about it, there shouldn't be a problem for him to learn force healing. Never mind that, he should theoretically be able to do whatever he wants with the force, being force Jesus and all that. Or I could be talking shite, no idea what the force must be like for him. Shrugging non-committally, I reply, I'm fine. Force healing safes my ass way too much for my own good. Absent-mindedly rubbing the smooth scar tissue, honestly, I'm more surprised that you've not got any yet. For me, it feels like a new one pops up every other day. Ahsoka's choice of clothing leaves little to the imagination. A tight brown tube top that covered her budding breasts was the only thing she wore on her upper body. Thanks to that, it was easy to tell the Clone Wars conflict hasn't given her any permanent damage, yet. Snorting, you're not the only one surprised. You should hear some of the plans my master comes up with. By the time she finished saying her piece, it looked like she was getting the secondhand shivers from memories. From behind her, a calloused hand clapped one of her Ahsoka's shoulders. They all worked though, didn't they? Anakin states with a reassuring smile. Looking at him, I wasn't sure if he was saying that jokingly or was genuinely proud of his not-so-well-thought-out stratagems. Nope, he's definitely pro, out of them. Before Ahsoka could say anything in retort, Isla alerted us to something on the horizon. Is that a village? she questioned. Pulling out his macro binoculars, Lucky was the one to confirm Isla's query. Yep, village ahead. Maybe 40-50 inhabitants if I had to guess, he told everyone. Think they'll have anything that'll help us contact the Republic? Ahsoka asked. Clipping the macro binoculars back onto his belt, Lucky replied. Doubt it, they're living in straw huts. Never seen anything more technologically advanced than a hoe either. Sighing in exasperation, Ahsoka turns to her master, seemingly looking for instruction on what to do next. Catching his apprentice's gaze, Anakin leaves the decision to Isla, the highest-ranking member of the group. Let's go. Even if they've not got anything that can help up on hand, we can still gather information from them. Maybe they could point us to someone who has what we need. Isla decided. Finally, I might get a break from all this walking. I'm not even sure you can call this a village. It's more or less just a loose collection of houses, if you can call these oval-looking things houses. Lucky gave us false info. What he saw weren't straw huts, but hollowed-out nuts, the same ones that I saw growing on the massive trees, and I was right about their size as well. On average, they're about double my height. Not much width to them, though. No chance I'll be sleeping inside them anytime soon. As we plodded into the village, 
the planet's native species, Lerman, eyed us warily. Tens of small lemur-like bodies poked out from all kinds of different places to get a look at us. I could hear the quiet murmuring of the Lerman as what looked to be the leader slowly sauntered towards us. Compared to the other Lerman, this one looked a lot more weathered with most of the hairs on his body a chalk white. The walking stick he held didn't make him look any younger either, neither did the hunchback or limp. Close enough that he would have to strain his voice, the elderly Lerman asked, What have you come here for? Is that an Irish accent? Chapter 44 In the thick of it five, I'm not hearing things, am I? That's definitely an Irish accent, or has it just been so long that I've forgotten what an Irish cunt sounds like? Either way, hearing it come from a Lerman felt weird to say the least. With the village head here, Isla introduced us. We're peacekeepers. We are Jedi from the Galactic Republic. Our ship crashed a few miles away, and our communications were lost in the crash. We would be grateful for any assistance you can give us. Not doing anything to hide his displeasure, with a disgruntled expression, the village head responds, Violence breeds violence. The Jedi are no peacekeepers. Glancing our lightsabers and the weapons the clones held as he spoke, he did hit the nail of the head with his words, though. Any party that has itself involved in a war can't proclaim themselves as peacekeepers, doubly so if the conflict is taking place on a galaxy-wide scale. Calling yourself a peacekeeper while leading legions of people into battle just makes you a hypocrite. The entire Jedi Order is a mess right now. It was already going in the wrong direction before the Clone Wars started, but the mass exposure to violence has done nothing but speed the process up. Jedi's mindsets have changed. No longer are they trying to put a peaceful end to the war. All they're doing is fanning the flames by sending their people out to different battlefronts across the galaxy. It's like they've all got a one-track mind, thinking that the Confederacy of Independent Systems is bad and the Republic is just dealing out justice. They've managed to delude themselves into imagining what they're doing is good. If they took a step back, they'd see how far they've fallen from their title as peacekeepers. Not that I'm saying there aren't any evil bastards in the Confederacy. There's plenty, but it's not like the Republic's any better. That's just the pot calling the kettle black. Clearly having something to say on the topic, Anakin proclaimed, We're fighting for freedom. I'm not really one for a clash of ideal, so while everyone was occupied with the village chief, I stood on the sidelines and sparked up a fag. In the process noting that the packet was nearly finished, and freedom and peace require fear and death, the elderly Lerman shot back. We colonized this system to find solace from your wretched war. We came here to find peace. Taking on an even more severe expression that I thought was possible for his Simeon-esque face, he firmly said, You must leave. You will only destroy what small amount of peace is left in the galaxy. You will only bring the destruction of us. Regardless of our part in the Clone Wars, we still need your help so we can leave, so you can continue to live here in peace, Isla said. Tam afraid I must do what's best for my people. We cannot help you, for then we would be taking a side in the conflict, no matter how minor our aid might be. He told them, his stance on the matter not eased in the slightest. Please, could you at least give us a hint? Anything. Ahsoka said attempting to bargain. Afraid not my dealer child. His gaze softened ever so slightly at the young Togruta, maybe feeling something along the lines of sympathy for the young Padawan from being thrust into war at such an age. Where's my sympathetic gaze? I'm younger than her. Eh, the verdicts are still out on that one. Deciding to speed the process up, I tell the village chief, if staying neutral's what you're worried about, you're better off just giving us a hand. I mean, wouldn't you wouldn't want the Confederacy rocking up to your doorstep and finding out that your village has been conversing with the Republic? Taking a moment for an inhale to bind dramatic tension. Who knows, maybe they'll jump to conclusions and think that the Lerman are planning to join the Republic. After all, those droids aren't the smartest things about. Ignoring the conflicted look I was getting from Ayla, and the neutral and surprised ones from Ahsoka and Anakin. I continued to stare down the elderly Lerman, and maybe, just maybe, using the Force to mess with his thought process. 
manipulating his chain of thought so he continuously dwelled over the negatives from choosing not to help us. Eventually, the constant downward spiral leads to fear, fear of the repercussions himself and his village would face, should he choose to ignore our plea for help. If you looked in the Jedi archives, well, probably not the normal one, but the archives that are only accessible to Jedi Masters. There's a high chance that what I'm currently using the Force to do is classed under the category of Force Fear, a dark side technique. One that doesn't actually require the dark side to use, it's just classed as such, since the Jedi scream hearsay at anything that invokes negative emotions. In reality, it should be put in the same boat as mind tricks and such. The Jedi are just too pussy to call it how it is. After a noticeable silence, the village head replied in an alarmed manner, I can't refuse a plea for help, can I? That's more like it. There's a high possibility that I'll get an earful from Isla for doing this, but honestly, I just don't care. The sun's going down, and all I want right now is some food, a drink, and a fucking sleep. A few fags as well. With all but Ayla happy with the development, they listened in as the village elder regained some semblance of calm. We can tell you about the location of other wreckages, but a Jedi must stay as insurance. We can't have you running off to tell the Republic about us and have them bring a legion of clones to occupy our planet. Abbott cautious, but whatever lets him sleep at night. Not like there's any value in occupying a neutral planet filled with fuck-all but grass and lermin. Either way, it works out for me. Till stay with them, I declared, probably too enthusiastically these few, and shooting my hand up for extra emphasis. Then it's decided. The rest of you follow me to my house and we'll tell you what we know. Wang Tu, take him to a free house, he said, turning around and hobbling towards the center of the village. Another Lerman, one much younger than the chief, split off from the group to get to me. He shared a vague resemblance to the elder, but it could just be me making things up, they all look pretty similar in my eyes. Please, follow me, beconded Wang Tu. Nice. Peace, a quiet at last, and no one to complain about me hotboxing the room. Wait, I'd prefer to stay with Lycan. Ayla decided before they left with the chief and the rest of the Lerman. I take it back. A bit of alone time with Isla can never go wrong. Chapter 45. In the thick of it, 6. He's been injured multiple times recently. I'd like to perform a checkup to make sure there are no underlying problems. Ayla stated. Nodding. I don't see a problem with that. In fact, my son, Wang Tu, is the village healer. I'm sure he would be happy to help you with that. The chief replies, gesturing at the Lerman at my side. His son, eh? Guess that's why they look similar, even for Lerman standards. But fuck that man. I was getting all excited for Isla's checkup, and now you're telling me that the hairy little Lerman is going to be the one doing it. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my night is ruined. That would be great. Isla respectfully accepted the help. Turning to the other two Jedi, she asked, Are you fine with this arrangement? If not, we can leave together after I'm finished with him. Glancing at Ahsoka, probing for an opinion, which he quickly got in the form of Ashrug, Anakin responded, I'm sure me and Snips can handle it, giving his Padawan a nudge on the shoulder for good measure. Yeah, we've got it covered. Just make sure the big guy's all right for me. Ahsoka said, jabbing her thumb in my direction, then sticking her tongue out at me when no one was looking. I'm grateful for your understanding. Ayla replied. Don't worry about it. I already owe Lycan one for saving me back when we were escaping the ship, Anakin said, giving a thankful nod and smile in my direction. Little things like that make you wonder how a genuinely nice guy like Anakin became a monster. The Jedi Order probably being the main culprit in the creation of Vader for not helping Anakin with the many chips on his shoulder. What he really needs is a therapist and some friends he can confide in. Bottling everything up and waiting for it to burst won't help anyone. Not Anakin, nor the younglings. Especially the younglings. Maybe I should invite him to the bar and get him properly shit-faced. Then me and Wires can watch on from behind the bar as he spills his heart out while he comes down with a severe case of the booze blues. That's a plan more solid than a Durasteel block. Turning to address Bly and Co. Ayla orders, you will all temporarily go under General Skywalker's command. Make sure to help him to the best of your abilities. Singling in on the medic of the team? 
Cameron, leave me one of the med packs before you leave. Of course, General, he promptly responded, saluting along with the rest of the clones. After that, the majority of people left for wherever the chief is taking them, leaving me and Isla with Wang Tu, the guide healer. Come this way, there is a place not far from here, he said. Keeping up with the Lumen's brisk pace, we arrived at one of the tall nut houses within the minute. Staring at the minuscule door, I wondered out loud, how the hell am I supposed to fit through that? Using dramatic gestures to emphasize the dog flap I was supposed to squeeze through. Before the Lerman could think himself into a knot, Ayla told me, don't fight it. Not knowing what I was supposed to be fighting, I was taken by surprise when I felt the force surround my body in an attempt to pick me up. Dispelling the protective force barrier around me, I let the force touch me and carry me through the air. Isla moved her fingers like a master puppeteer pulling my strings with the force, all the while I dumbly spun around as if I were in zero gravity. T don't think I'm going to make it, I said, as the ground and edges of the door came dangerously close to the tender scar tissue. My worries were unfounded, though, as Isla's masterful control over the force safely passed me through the narrow space completely unharmed. It was only after I watched her crawl inside after me did I realize the show I just missed. Lamenting the unjust nature of life, Wang Tu and Isla began my checkup. With them poking a prodding all over my body, it felt like I was some kind of experimental subject. Doubly so when the Lerman healer started putting weird plant paste over my ska, our tissue. Apparently it makes the skin regrow faster. I just shrugged and decided to wait and see if the paste works or if the little monkey's taking out his arse. After they finished the checkup, I was cleared. Everything was in order, no bones out of place or organs missing. All I was prescribed was a good rest to let the medicine do its job, and I was told to stay off the drink as well. Wang Tu left, and Isla instantly began enforcing the no-drink policy. Or as I realized, when I reached for my flask, she was already enforcing the policy the second she squeezed me through that door. Must have slipped it out with the force during the process. Too bad she never thought about checking my other pockets. It's a good thing I always bring a back up. I replied by taking a flask from my robe's inner pocket. No doubt resisting the urge to force choke me for my antics, Ayla brusquely snapped. Where do you even pull these from? Flicking open the lid, I answered cryptically, with all the grandeur of a master alcoholic. A magician never reveals their secrets. Downing a quick swig, I give her some solid advice. But for beginners such as yourself, keeping a backup, backup should suffice for most situations. Man, Rail would be proud of my preparations. I wonder how he's doing anyway. The guy kind of fell off the grid since the war started. Pulling the backup, backup flask from my grasp, Isla yells, I am not an alcoholic. Those two flasks are telling me a different story though, I said while eyeing the alcoholic beverages in her hands. Somehow this seemed to enrage her further. Support me on pa.com slash dodgy writer, discord, s card, s -Z -A. Chapter 46, In the Thick of It 7 After an uncomfortable night's rest on the floor, since the Lerman-sized bed was too small for my stature, I woke up in surprisingly little pain. That medicine definitely did its job, it even has me smelling like flowers. If the clones were actually paid, I'd ask for the recipe and start punting it through the entire gar. Have the clones smelling so nice, the enemy won't even want to fight them. I took a cursory glance round the tent to find that I was the only one still here. Isla must have got up early to welcome back Anakin and Ahsoka. Realizing that I felt a good few false light than normal, I flusteredly patted myself down only to find that my entire supply of alcohol was missing. Bastard! She must have taken them while I was sleeping, I spat. Ick knew the Jedi were going downhill, but this is a new low even for them. Stealing! Have the protectors of the galaxy devolved into common thieves? Who would have thought that they stoop so low that they'd even steal from one of their own? No matter how improper it is to be drinking on the job. I thought I taught Ayla better. Annoyed and ultra-sober, I left the tent. Shielding my eyes from the morning sun that infuriated my alcohol-cleansed system. How was I supposed to make it through the day at this rate? Looking around the village, I noticed that everything was unusually messy compared to last night. 
Yesterday, when we found this place, everything was in pristine condition. But now the paths are littered with randomly placed lurmen. Utensils. Is that a fucking lurum on the roof? Training my eyes onto one of the sloped roofs, I gawked at the passed-out lurman, who was lying in what must have been an exceedingly uncomfortable position. I mean, the guy's spines literally in an upside-down V. Someone's going to be in agony when they wake up. Letting the Force channel through me, I allowed me to sense the location of the other Jedi. Them, along with the clones, were all sitting around a rock on the outskirts of the village, probably waiting for me to wake up. As useful as the whole Force GPS thing was, I found it tremendously creepy at times, because if you don't go out of your way to cloak yourself from other Jedi, they can genuinely sense you from nearly anywhere in the galaxy. It's so bad that even when I don't intentionally try to sense the other Jedi, I still get this weird feeling in the back of my mind that tells me they're all alive and well. It's as if we're all connected in this massive Force spiderweb that lets everyone sense your status. That's why I tend to cloak myself whenever I'm out and about in Coruscant. Can't have wee Yoda peeking at me going to town on some hot bird I met at the bar. On my way out of the village, I mulled over what the fuck happened while I was sleeping. The entire village looks like a house the day after a mad party. Skywalker and Ayla were locked in conversation, so the first to notice my arrival was a Hoxa, who promptly sprang up from her seated position to taunt me at her earliest convenience. Look who finally decided to show up. The adolescent Torgruda gibbed, pushing a fist out in my direction. Come back with that attitude after you've been blown up. We'll see if you can walk about the next day, I remarked, fulfilling her wish for a fist bump in the process. Laughing it off, Ahsoka replies, Keep dreaming. I'm too good to be caught out like that. If you're so good, why'd you trigger that tripwire on Christophsis? Interjected Anakin. Finish talking to Ayla, he adds. Or what about the time you and Master Luminara let Gunray escape? While Anakin humbled Ahsoka, I straight up asked Ayla what she did with my flasks, since she clearly never had them in person. Those skin-tight clothes weren't hiding anything, neither her curves nor my flasks. Your flasks? I gave them to the Lerman for safekeeping she stated, before her lips curled into a mischievous smirk, though I'm not sure how well they looked after them. The scenes of the messed-up Lerman village flashed through my head as I pieced in the missing parts of the puzzle. Seriously? They drank that? I exclaimed, honestly shocked that the small creatures stomached that. Half of them won't wake up today. The stuff in those flasks were a midget's ball hair off pure ethanol, there's now way their tiny bodies could handle that. Nonchalantly shrugging her shoulders, Ayla told me, I wouldn't worry too much. Lerman's livers have one of the best filtration systems in the galaxy. If one never knew any better, I'd say they could give you a run for your money. Well, well, well. Color me impressed. Clearly some kind of multiversal shenanigans have given these Irish-accented monkeys the high alcohol tolerance of the singing pricks back on Earth. Eh. It could have been used in a worse way. Walking away from Ayla and towards the hills, I said, Guess I better get to distilling the local flora then. Yanking me back into place, Ayla says, You're not going anywhere. We've got some bad news. The Separatists are stationed on this planet. Escaping for Skywalker's lecture, Ahsoka was eager to get me up to speed. They've got a whole outpost a few miles from here. Their defenses are tight. Looks like they're protecting some new tank. Adding on to his Padawan's statement, it's huge, bigger than anything they've used till now, looks like it's using a new kind of ammunition as well. While he spoke, Lucky handed me a holodisc that projected an image of the Separatist compound. Zooming in on the tank, its bulky image jogs my memory, and I remember what we were up against. It was from an episode of The Clone Wars, I can't remember the name of it, but I do remember what it does. The real problem isn't the tank, but the ammunition it uses. If he recalls correctly, it's some kind of anti-life weapon that only burns living targets. An incredible weapon if your entire army is made of droids. Not so incredible for the Republic, though. But the good news is that this is the only one in service. So by destroying it and apprehending Nemodian running the operation, we'll have saved millions of clones from a painful fire-induced death. Suddenly an image blurred through my mind. 
the massive separatist tank was charging through the tall, grassy plains. Ahead of it were several companies of B-1 battle droids. The angle of the vision changed, turning and allowing me to see the Lerman village directly in the separatists' path. While I shook my head and regained my bearings, Ayla explained, We'll attack the base come nightfall. Should the attack be successful, we can use the long-range communicators to contact the Republic for an extraction. T don't think we'll need to go anywhere. They're coming to us. Support me amount.com flag G writer. Discord. H Scar Dark Valve Bro. Chapter 47. In the thick of it. 8. They're what? Everyone shouted in unison, save Bly, whose eyes widened an imperceptible amount. You heard me, I stated, while rubbing my temples, suddenly wishing the Lerman left some booze for me. I just had a vision. That big ass tank's heading over to the village, along with an escort of droids. Three, maybe five hundred in total. Are you sure? Ayla asked. Damn sure, unless the force is just fucking with me. In fact, I said while glancing between the clones, Lucky let me borrow these for a second. Pulling the binoculars off his utility belt, I held them tight before bending my legs and performing a giant force-aided leap straight into the air. Reaching the apex at about twenty meters, I quickly put the binoculars to work and took a brief look around. Managing to catch sight of several moving objects, I jumped back up to make sure it was the Separatists. With confirmation that it was them, I gave everyone the bad news. About five clicks out in that direction, I said, pointing to the slightly hilly plains to the north. We've got about half an hour before they're in firing distance. So, anyone got any ideas? The group quickly began to come up with a survival plan, while increasingly more incredulous ideas were being given by Anakin, Isla reminded everyone about something they overlooked till now. We need to wake the Lerman up and get them out of here, she said, reminding everyone here that at least half the village is comatose. Till handle it, I told her. Bringing my fingers up to the corners of my mouth, I let loose a disturbingly loud whistle that clattered off the sleeping Lerman's eardrums. What followed was a symphony of grunts and cusses, the Lerman clearly weren't happy with being woken up so early after a night of heavy drinking, but survival sadly takes priority over nursing a hangover. Rounding the grumpy Lerman up, I told them their current predicament. Listen up, you thieving bastards. The Separatists are on their way over here right now, and if you don't make a decision on what you're going to do very soon, you who be able to make a decision at all. So, are you going to run away and hide, or stay here and help up fight them? There was a brief period of silence as my words sank in, but breaking it was none other than the village elder. What menace have you brought upon our village now, Jedi? Father, you can't blame them. Want to, contended, seeming fed up with his father's neutrality. Pitching in, Anakin states, he's right. The Separatists don't know we're here, and if they're rushing over here with a battalion of droids, I doubt that they will come in peace. Staying stubborn, the Elder argues, your presence here endangers us. Leave before they arrive and we may still be able to enter talks with them. This cunt's got a few screws loose. I can't claim to know what he's been through that made him his way, but can't he see that nothing they have is worth anything in the Separatist's eyes? How can you talk them out of whatever they're about to do if you don't have anything to appease them? Following in her master's footsteps, Ahsoka refuted, but they won't listen, and you'll have no way to defend yourself. You'll need our help to fight back. We won't fight at all. The elder stalwartly stated, we would rather die than to kill others. His word drew mixed reactions out of the other Lerman. Before our very eyes, two factions were forming. You had the pacifists that wanted to do anything else but fight. That was mostly made up of the older members of the tribe. From what I could gleam, most of them would have rather left the village than try to bargain with the Separatists, but never voiced it since the Elder had already made his mind up. Rallying behind Wang Tu were those who wanted to aid us in defending the village against the Separatists. Those who followed Wang Tu were mostly of the younger generation who didn't want to risk losing the village they grew up in without a fight. You do realize that droids aren't alive. I said, pointing out a flaw in the Elder's argument, but it was easily ignored in favor of Ahsoka's passionate rambling. But how could you? 
In the middle of another speech, Ahsoka was cut off by Isla. Ahsoka, stop. If they want to remain neutral, we won't force them into war. She told the Padawan before shifting her gaze to the Elder. See to it that your people temporarily leave the village. I know the Separatists, and I can guarantee that their arrival won't end with a talk. All I'm asking you to do is to vacate the area so that we can handle this. We can't let you do this yourselves. Turning to the Elder, Wang Tu passionately says, Father, even if we don't fight the Separatists, we must defend ourselves. Showing anger for the first time since we arrived, the Elder attested, Mounting a defense is still engaging in battle. If we sacrifice our beliefs, we're no better than they are. Our philosophy has helped us survive for generations. Why should we change it now? Because times have changed. There's a war going on in the galaxy. How can we hope to live peacefully if we aren't willing to defend that peace? What will happen after we abandon this planet? Will you continue to run away every time trouble finds us? On an entirely different note, Captain Rex and Flash just arrived and told the generals, The shield generator is ready, sir ma'am. Quality. They must have brought it back from the ship wreckage. At least we won't be blown to smithereens by artillery fire now, nor will the Lerman village get torn asunder from the battle. While walking away from the village with several other Lerman, the elder shouted, You can still come with us. It's not too late, Wang Tu. Aw, oh, I. I might have used a mind trick of subtly convince the Elder to fuck off. Can't be arse putting up with his peace rants while I'm chopping fuck out of battle droids. With a complicated look in his eyes, Wang Tu shook his head, turning away from his father. Bringing the Lerman that decide to say over to us, he asked, Please Jedi, give us something to do. We can't just stand by and watch while you risk your lives for us. Support me on Patreon on Dodgy Writer Discord tplatch Discord slash srgba. Chapter 48. In the thick of it, nine. Nodding his head, Anakin called out to his second in command, Rex. You came up with the plan. Have you got anything for them to do? Stroking his chin, Rex said, "I do, but you might not like it. It involves using the empty houses as a protective perimeter. Don't worry about them. What's a few houses compared to our entire village?" Wang Tu assured the clone trooper. Good, with that kind of attitude, you'll make it through this, no problem. Grabbing a stick of the ground, Rex began sketching out where he wants the makeshift barriers to go, as well as a few traps that the Lerman could use to stall battle droids. While the Lerman got to work on fortifying the village, I asked Bly if there was any scrap metal lying about inside or nearby the village. I had something I wanted to test out, but I'll need to make something to try it. No, sir, the Lerman don't have any metals stored in their village, and the closest crash site is miles away. Bly concluded, putting an end to my idea before it even started. Bastard, I spat, before getting blinded by the glare coming off my body armor's wrist guard. Aha! It's all good, Bly. Don't worry about it. Tell the general that I'm doing something important in case she thinks him slacking off. Why don't you tell me right now? A pleasant, accented voice said from behind me. That I will, I responded, pivoting around to face my outrageously hot master. Basically, I have a method that should be able to take out the huge tank that's on its way over, but I'll need to make something to help do it. And that's why you need the metal? She probed. Yep, going to use my armor for it. There should be enough durasteel if you total it all, I responded. Be honest with me, what's the chances of it working? Ayla questioned. A solid 90%, if worst comes to worst, will just follow Rex's plan. There's not much risk if something goes wrong. I answered, keeping to myself that there's a massive probability that I'll be taken out of commission if I do it wrong. Satisfied, Ayla nodded. Well, get to it then. I'll tell the others about it. Walking away, she left me myself to unequip my armor and throw it into a pile on the ground. Once I had finished removing everything apart from Jango Fett's Mandalorian wrist guard, I grasped the pile of durasteel with the force and made it levitate at eye level. Igniting my lightsaber, using the heat from the blade, I began to melt the armor down to its malleable liquid form. As the durasteel turned into a bright mess of molten metal, I used the force to hold it in the air and shape it to my will. The scalding hot liquid was quickly shaped into a long cylinder that slightly resembled a rocket. 
Then I started to rapidly spin it until the durasteel cooled down enough. When it had reached a lower temperature, I fine-tuned the design, adding a coned nose and a few fins at its rear end, giving the missile-like block of durasteel its final shape. Happy with its design, I lugged it over my shoulder and lifted it over to the, the makeshift wall everyone was making. They're here! Ahsoka shouted from her vantage point on top of the wall. With Ahsoka's early warning, Jedi, clones, and Lerman all poked their head over the seed wall to glance at the Separatist convoy. Even at a distance, we could still clearly make out the shape of the colossal tank that menacingly hovered towards us. The holograms never did this beast justice. The tank was like a moving mountain, and its huge barrel seemed as if it would pierce the sky if it were any bigger. Not as noticeable as the tank were the small specks of dark gray and cream dotted around just ahead to the behemoth. Companies of B-1s and B-2s were marching in large square formation. Their steps were all synchronized, sending dull booming sounds across the plains that slowly got louder and louder. Having never seen anything quite like it in their lives, the lermen that stayed behind were filled with nervous tension that only seemed to get worse the closer the hump. E droids got, though holding them in place was a fiercely resolute determination that prompted them to hold their ground. I sensed nervousness permeating from Isla that she seemed to release by chewing her bottom lip as she asked, When are you going to do the thing? Wait for them to fire whatever's in that cannon. I'll need peace of mind before trying this, or I might just fuck up. I responded, holding the metallic pike up to my eyes preemptively adjusting my for when one let it rip. Before Ayla could reply to my words, the thunderous noise of screeching metal resounded in everyone's eardrums, prompting many to try and block out the noise by cupping their ears. The cause of the ear-splitting grinding was the huge separatist tank raising its mammoth cannon to the skies, preparing to blast us all to oblivion. It slowly picked out the correct angle for firing and started to build up charge. Just before the tank's charge could build up to critical levels, I heard Anakin shout an order to one of the clones. Now, turn the shield generator on. Due to the clones keeping the generator's engines warm, a white pillar of energy shot from the oddly shaped device near instantly. Once it reached a certain height, the white pillar fell to the sides, forming a blue dome of energy that would, hopefully, protect us. As the edges of the shield's curtain touched the ground, the tank's weapon fired a large, obscurely shaped projectile that slammed to the ground a few tens of meters away from the shields. From the impact crater spewed a veritable sea of ravenous flame that quickly scorched across the long grass-filled plains, stopping at nothing but the inanimate shimmering shields, which stood completely out of place in the blackened fields. The Lerman were horrified at the devastation wrought by the Separatist weapons, silently clenching their fists. They prayed that the group that left made it far enough away to avoid the all-engulfing fire. Lycan. My master called me, urging me to start. She had the same worries as the Lerman, but kept them hidden behind a stoic mask so as to not demoralize our new allies. Flicking my neck to each side, letting the build-up tension disappear in the form of two pops, I say, guess it's now or never then. Stepping up to the peak of the wall, I let the force carry the durasteel projectile into position. With the rod floating in place in front of my face, luminous yellow lightning began to crackle on my palms. Drop the shield when I give the signal, I told my allies. The lightning intensified, cackling wildly as it was applied to the durasteel, but that was just the start. Pushing even harder, the streaks of electricity grew to the size of my forearms as the magnetic imbalance created from the technique threatened to send the durasteel flying. Multitasking, I forced the rod to stay in place as the pressure continued to build. Wild arcs of lightning began to slip from my control, charring the ground around me, and a few even coming close to the Lerman until Anakin and Ayla used their lightsabers to block. Feeling my grip on the durasteel about to slip, I bawled at the shield generator cunts. Now! Thankfully they heard, and the blue curtain began receding, giving me the room necessary to let it fly. With a grand gong, the sloppily made railgun ammunition launched off at ridiculous speeds, fully intent of decimating the Separatist Battalion. Support me on pa.treon.com slash Discord 
Discord. Slash slash Chapter 49. In the Thick of It 10. Upon release, the magnetic field created from the force judgment forced the railgun projectile to blast away at perverse speeds, in the process causing a loud sonic boom at point-blank range that shattered my eardrum and made my internal organ tremble. The blood spurting from my ears signified the sudden deafening of the world around me and my vision started to go blurry. Both of these symptoms were accompanied by a sudden bout of dizziness, compelling me to fall on my tattooed arse and nearly fall head first off the wall. Luckily, I just managed to change the direction of my fall, which ended with me tripping to the side and getting a 90 degrees tilted view of the devastation my force railgun just caused. The previously mighty separatist land force was reduced to rubble with barely a few stragglers still marching towards the village. The survivors had a, in my humble opinion, a picturesque backdrop that consisted of thick black smoke and flaming mechanical parts that further accentuated the damage done. It was beautiful. A truly magnificent display of the destruction someone competent in the force can cause, and I was damn chuffed that said person was me. Patting my own back could only last so long, though, as having both of my eardrums burst at the same time cranked my nausea up to max level, caused me to lurch and dry heave as I attempted to rise to my feet. While I used the force to restore balance to my body, I silently thanked Ayla for keeping me away from the booze. I don't think I could have held back from spewing if I had some, and nothing ruins a badass scene more than vomit. Luckily, the damage I sustained was healed up quickly, because while the effects were annoying and immediate, the injuries themselves weren't particularly bad. Now back to full fitness, I rose to my feet, ignited my purple saber staff, and charged ahead to scrounge for some destroy the rest of the hostile combatants. It was only when I was halfway there, I realized that I was the only one attacking. I'll admit, I was on the fence about going along with General Sakura's Padawan's decision, but having saved me from a nasty injury yesterday, I decided to give him the benefit of the doubt. It wasn't just General Sakura's faith in her abnormally large for his species Padawan, nor my own, at times reckless protege's chatter about her giant horned friend that brought me to my decision. It was my own personal views on teaching that allowed me to take a back seat for once. As much as I respect. The traditional teachings of the Jedi, I'm of the small group that think that practical experience is what truly makes a great warrior. Especially experiences like these where you're forced against a wall and have to get outside of your comfort zone to achieve victory. No matter how nonsensical an idea it is, if you manage to bypass the hurdle, you always come out stronger in the end. Momentarily, I debated asking for Ahsoka's opinion on how we should proceed but discarded it a moment later. As skilled as young Snips was, she still has a long way to go before she can stand by herself on her own two feet. Giving her something like this is too much, too soon, and could cripple her futures if handled incorrectly. When the droid battalion appeared and I saw the devastation their weapon wrought, I'll admit I was precarious if Lycan's idea could have made a difference. Thankfully, this was one of the rare times my instincts were pleasantly wrong. Lycan's force technique really went over and above what was expected of him. There wasn't even a need to defend the village anymore. There were no attackers left after the force aided. Railgun? Maybe I should ask Obi-Wan if he knows anyone that would be willing to teach me this lightning technique. Master, pinch me, I half-jokingly said, only to yelp in pain when he really did it. Rubbing the assaulted patch of skin on my upper arm, I took a second look at the metallic mess that was the Separatist ground force, and thought how Lai, Can, was able to pull off such a feat. It was a jaw-dropping experience. I've not even seen Master do anything close to it with the force, and honestly I'm not sure if I want to. For all its glory, that kind of strength scares me. Using the force to cause such destruction was a perversion of the Order's teachings, even so, when it comes to battles, I couldn't help but think the Order was wrong, as none of their pacifist teachings have helped me during my time as a commander of the Five of First. Lycan, though, has never seemed to care about what the Council, or anyone for that matter, thinks. He's always been a bit of a deviant ever since she could remember, 
It's like the philosophies went in one ear and out the other with him. It's strange. Sometimes he'll sit down and act as wise as Master Plo. Then two seconds later, he'd be leering at the older female Jedi with a questionable intent and cussing at Knox, putting shame to everything the Order stands for. But there has to be a method to his madness if this is the kind of power he's wielding. So far, my thoughts on the matter were staggeringly contradictory. I'll need to request guidance from Master when we return. I could sense darkness in Lycan. More than myself, Master Voss, and even Master Windu. It's like he's walking on a tightrope of equilibrium between the dark side and the light. I knew it when I was first assigned as his master. Everything he does, everything that makes him him, is in direct opposition to what the Council would call a model Jedi. But this war has skewed that balance. It's taken a toll on him, as it has for all of us. It's made him more violent, more volatile, and despite my assurance that I've got him under control, it's made him a cause for worry in the Council's ranks. Though me and many others who know him have managed to keep them off his back for now, even Master Windu couldn't sway the decision of the other Masters any longer. The spectacular display of power he gas just gave everyone will only further fan the flames threatening to swallow him whole. There's no putting it off any longer. Once we return to Coruscant, Lycan will be faced with fate-defining crossroads, and the outcome all depends on the decisions he makes. But no matter how it turns out in the end, I'll be there to support him. As much as it goes against the core principles of the Jedi, my heart can help but ache knowing our time as Master and Padawan would soon be coming to its end. Chapter 50. The Verdict After showcasing my supreme, Jigga Chad, Big Dick energy by eviscerating the Separatist ground force with a force railgun, I was greeted with cheers upon my return to the Lerman village. The little hairy fuckers were in awe as I swaggered past them like a proper hardman on level 1313 of Coruscant. A good few collapsed to the ground with tears welling in their eyes. Poor bastards. They must have been terrified and the thought of fighting for the first time in their lives. And now they're in the clear. All of their built of stress gushed from their small bodies in a variety of different ways. Or maybe they just collapsed in reverie from the sheer awesomeness of my display. Truly, one of the greatest things I've ever done. Lycan, what the heck was that? Skywalker's young protege excitedly asked, her eyes twinkling with youthful curiosity as she gazed up at me. Just the physical manifestation of my epicness, I nonchalantly replied. Ahsoka's lips twitched in a mix of annoyance and amusement before urging, You've got to teach me how to do that. Come on, pretty please. Hitting me with puppy dog eyes that would have no doubt convinced the many pedophiles in the galaxy. But I was no pedo. Nor did I plan to teach anyone else how to turn themselves into a one-man artillery unit. Not a chance. You'd end up ripping yourself apart trying that. Forcefully tensing my large, muscular biceps that positively popped with power, I continued, you'd need muscles like this kiddo before trying one I just done. Now that I started to cleanse my body from the enhancements granted by the Force, I really began to feel the aftershock of using that last attack. Tremors traveled through my bones, causing my entire body to feel shaky and weak. Suddenly, out of nowhere, someone lightly pinched my arm, sending a sharp pain shooting through its entire length. Barely holding back a yelp, I turned to catch a view of the sexy blue perpetrator. Less flexing, more healing. Wang Tu just fixed you up this morning and you've already managed to hurt yourself again. Ayla said in a mix of worry and exasperation. Doing just that, I say to Ahsoka, is your master as demanding as mine? I swear Padawans are just the gophers of the order. Even worse. The young Togruta sighed. Master Skywalkers, that kind of person that would teach you how to swim by throwing you into the deep end. Plus none of us can heal, so there's none of that happening unless there's a back to tank nearby. Fuck that noise, man. I wouldn't have the balls to follow half of Anakin's suicide plans. The clones under him must have a screw loose for going along with them. In fact, scratch that. Those clones have to be certifiably mad. Sounds like a great time. I lied. Inspecting my body for any lingering effects from using the railgun, Ayla told us, Once you're ready... We'll head to the Separatist outpost and either take a ship or use the radio to call in a pickup. Shite, 
I totally forgot about the fat Nemoidian that ran this operation. I'm probably better off keeping quiet about that one, letting the order know I sent one of the high-ranking separatists to a brutal fiery death might not be the best decision. No problem, I'll be sorted in a few minutes. I replied, already feeling the muscle pain starting to dull. Coruscant, Jedi Temple. Home sweet home, or so I'd like to say. The Jedi Temple has never been my favorite place in the galaxy, and never will be. Every second of the time I spend in there feeling disgustingly empty, and it's getting worse. You could feel hints of it when I first arrived here, but now, years later, the sensation was alarming. It was as if the force that breathed life into the Jedi's holy ground was being corrupted, rotting the paragon of light from the inside out. I'm sure everyone else can feel it too. The atmosphere of the temple says it all. The once bustling halls were now filled with nothing but the echoes of its past glory. There were hardly any Jedi stationed on Coruscant anymore, and the ones that were either T, MPL guards, or elderly members of the Order who were now tasked with teaching the younglings since they are too old to be of any use in combat. For those that return between missions, most of their time is spent meditating in isolation to keep their minds aligned with the light. As the raging, galaxy-spanning conflict seduces all Jedi to lose their inhibitions in the chaos. Then you've got me, who was fucking choking for a pint and half a deck of fags while walking through said holy temple. What am I being dragged to the council for? I moaned at Isla, who walked in tandem next to me. I've not given them a report in, ever. Fiddling with the ends of her leku, Isla states, It's not a report we're going to the council for. What's it for then? Come on, don't leave me hanging, I pressed. Averting her eyes to one of the many intricate wall carvings dotted around the temple's interior, Isla somewhat sheepishly murmured, I dot cannot divulge such information at the present time. This is doing my head in. She sounds like a droid answering machine. Ayla's been acting strange the whole return trip. Now that we've arrived, it's gotten worse. Constant fidgeting, stuttering when speaking, she's acting like me after I've gone a day sober. Either I'm in severely deep shit, or her period has come early. Stopping in front of the large sliding doors that hid the council chambers from prying eyes, Isla told me, I know it's difficult to ask, but remember and be polite, and by that I mean keep a lid on the swearing. What's the occasion? I smirked at her seriousness. Please, Lycan, for me, she begged. Sighing, I said, I'll give it a shot then. No promises if that four-headed fuck starts spouting shit, though. Breaking the tension slightly, Isla lips from a smile as she says, I wouldn't want to stop you if he does. Before flicking her finger to the side and using the force to open the metallic doors. A moment the doors were breached, the both of us were hit with the bright lights of the Coruscant skyline that seeped in from the large windows stationed in the council room. With my eyes promptly adjusting, I was able to see the mostly holographic forms of the Jedi Masters who lead the Order. Though the two who drew my eyes were both here in person, Grandmaster Yoda and the powerful Mace Windu, Support me on piad.com.uwriter, Discord, Discord, Rai, Esch, Biabalu.